Good morning, or good afternoon. Hey guys, and welcome to another review lesson. We're going through and just sort of going back over some of the important things that we've learned about an IB this year. And thus far, we have covered uh, the first two categories of the four major macromolecules, which are carbs and lipids. And today we're going to cover just proteins and enzymes. Now, enzymes are not a different category of macromolecule. They're just a type of protein, and we're gonna try to sort out that understanding here in a little bit. But we're just going to focus on proteins because they are a very big topic and then we will go ahead and move on to nucleic acids as the last one and then the properties of water so without any further ado let's go ahead and dive into proteins today we're going to be talking about amino acid structure amino acids are the monomers or small lego pieces that make up the big lego sets that we call proteins we're going to talk about polypeptide formation which is how we take those small lego pieces and put them together uh, different levels of protein structure so as we can see here proteins can assume many different shapes and structures in three dimensions, protein functions, what they do, denaturation, which is a huge problem for proteins, and then how we actually go from a gene to a polypeptide. We'll touch briefly on that, but that goes back to the transcription, translation stuff we have learned before. And finally, what exactly is a proteome? So amino acids. Amino acids are the monomers or recurring uh, little subunits that make up proteins. Uh, proteins are composed of uh, amino acids that can take 20 different forms. Okay, so the, the central or excuse me, the standard model for an amino acid is that you have a central carbon with uh, an amine group, which is NH2 coming off of one side and a carboxyl group, which is COOH coming off the other, uh, a hydrogen coming off of it, and then an R group. Now, as we can see, this carbon has four bonds. And we talked about the fact that carbon was so important to these uh, organic molecules because it could form four bonds because it has four available spaces for additional valence electrons to make up its outer shell. This R right here doesn't represent an actual group. It's called a variable group, variable group because it can represent any one of 20 different groups. The only difference between each of these 20 amino acids is the R group. They look exactly the same in terms of their carboxyl, amine, and hydrogen that comes off the central carbon. The only difference is that each one of them has their own special variable group. And the variable group is going to decide how these amino acids specifically bind together to form that three-dimensional shape they're so famous for. So you can think of the variable group as being a special kind of magnet or you know if you want to think about it in terms of characters if that's easier for you to think about it you can think of it as their character trait the unique and individual flavor of each of the amino acids so this is what it might look like in a three-dimensional model taking into account that the variable group is going to be different sizes and shapes depending on the amino acid that we're looking at so as you can see there are many kinds of amino acids and we group them based off the properties of their R group the nonpolar R groups, in other words, those that don't bind well with water and are generally called hydrophobic because they, are, of course, want to get away from water, just like most lipids, those we can see are here. And we look at their, uh, their groups and we can see that a lot of their groups are just made out of carbon, hydrogen, and perhaps sulfur. Carbon and hydrogen oftentimes make up a lot of lipids. And we can see that without any oxygens, it usually doesn't lend very much um, to go on in terms of charge. So that's why we don't have a lot of polarity in these molecules. This is just carbon and hydrogen bond. So a lot of methyl groups, a lot of that sort of thing. So this is what we call the nonpolar groups. The polar group are going to be the ones that are going to bind very well with water. We can see that we've added in some oxygen and some nitrogen into these to make them a little bit more charged and a little bit um, more uh, unevenly distributed in, in accordance with their charge. As you know, polar means that a molecule has an uneven distribution of charge, so a positive end and a negative end. Adding oxygens is usually a great way to do that. We can see hydroxyl group right here. That's going to be negative, uh, negatively charged, uh, and so on and so forth. So these are going to be the ones that are going to be hydrophilic. They're going to want to play nice with water. So in other words, they'll be attracted to water versus these guys, which will want to get away from it. Then we have positively charged. So over here, we're just going to have a string of molecules on the R group that's going to give this a positive or ionic charge. As we know, uh, that the bonds that can form between amino acids are going to be covalent bonds, wherein they're sharing electrons. Uh, that can often happen between nonpolar groups. Uh, we're going to have hydrogen bonds, which are usually going to be weak associations between the uneven charges and polar groups. And we're going to have ionic bonds, which are going to be between the strong electric uh, associations between positively and negatively charged. Uh, R groups. So here are going to be some of those positively charged R groups and negatively charged R groups, and of course these are going to be attracted to one another. 
So let's talk a little bit about polypeptides. So we've seen the diversity within the 20 amino acids, and we've seen that the only difference between them is their R groups. The amino acids are usually covalently linked together by peptide bonds. This is, uh, if you remember back to translation, this is mediated by your uh, ribosomes or your rRNA subunits. Essentially what they do is they take the incoming amino acids that are attached to the tRNAs, and they bind them together using this peptide bond, which we know from our previous lesson is a form uh, of dehydration bond or condensation reaction. Uh, in other words, water is cleaved from the molecule and it joins two amino acids together. Now what is always going to be true is that it's going to join together the amine group, the NH2 group of one, to the carboxyl group, the COOH group of the other. Now here it already shows the bond formed, but uh, we know that it has to produce water and that we had to have more stuff in here. Um, specifically, if you look back at the original picture, whoops, the original picture of the amino acid, we can see NH group, the amine group is an NH2, so it has a nitrogen with two hydrogens, and the carboxyl group is a COOH group, which has one carbon, two oxygens, and one hydrogen. If we go over here to see them already bound together, we can see we're missing a hydrogen from the N, and we're missing an OH from the COOH, from the carboxyl group. So missing a hydrogen from the, from the amine and OH from this one it equals H2O. So that makes a lot of sense. So we pulled out that water molecule, and now we have two amino acids that are bound together with their R groups in close association. Now, again, this is a covalent bond between the central, car uh, well, not between the central, car between the carboxyl group of one uh, amino acid and between the amine of the other. We haven't actually gotten into the three-dimensional R group uh, bonds yet, so this is just along the central axis or backbone of this molecule. We call this a peptide bond when it happens between amino acids, uh, and again, it's formed by the process of translation and condensation reactions. Polypeptides are going to start folding into unique shapes. So proteins in and of themselves aren't really all that remarkable. It's the shapes that they fold into that determine their function in the body and therefore how remarkable they actually are. So there are four levels of protein structure. We've talked mainly about three, but today we're going to focus on the last one a little bit more than we did previously. So the primary structure is literally just the chain of amino acids. Okay, The primary structure is going to change based on each protein that is made. So in other words, the ways in it's which is going to change is the amino acids that make it up. So whether it's made out of histidine, arginine, lysine, or whether it's made mostly out of valine, proline, or methionine. So whichever the composition is going to change the primary structure. It's also going to be their order. You could either have two lysines, one histine, and one arginine, or you could have lysine, histine, arginine, lysine. Okay, so the order and composition of the amino acids that make up the polypeptide are going to determine its primary structure. Again, though, they're just a string of covalently bonded amino acids, and there's no actual folding or shape taking place. Secondary structures are going to happen when we end up getting bonds between not the R groups of these, but between the other groups. So the groups that are coming off of this, so the H's and the O's and the H's that are coming off of this central carbon and this amine group and this hydroxyl group, those are going to start to form bonds with other parts of the long chain. And those bonds are going to fold these guys into a secondary shape. The secondary shape can be a beta sheet, as we see on this picture right here, or it can be an alpha helix, as we see in the initial illustration and in this one right here. So that's what we call secondary structure when we get that secondary bonding. The tertiary bonding, so this specific three-dimensional, more complex shape that the protein folds into, is going to be due uh, based on it's going to be due to the bonds between R groups. So that's where we're going to end up getting that polar, nonpolar, negative charge, and all that stuff coming in. These charges are going to determine which R groups are going to bind together, and that's going to determine the three-dimensional structure. As we can see, the three-dimensional structure uh, contains some of the, the some of the secondary structures. So these helices don't go away. They're still there. They're just a part of this larger folding structure. And then if, this doesn't always happen, but if several tertiary structures are meant to fit together, like, uh, I don't know, if you've ever watched the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, you know, they had all those animals that would like form into the giant robot and, you know, each animal was like their car, but it would like fit together into the arms and legs of the robot or Ultra, whatever. You, you guys know what I'm talking about. Hopefully. Anyway, if you don't look it up, it's really cheesy and wow, it's very, very badly written. But anyway, um, so that forms into the quaternary structure. So you basically have uh, several tertiary forms coming together to form a larger structure. And a great example of this is hemoglobin in your blood that carries iron and oxygen. 
So let's talk about the primary structure. So we can see here, again, this is, describes the order of amino acids. It's formed by covalent uh, peptide bonds and controls all subsequent levels of protein structure. This is essential. If you change the primary structure, you will change all structures that follow it, okay? It's the domino effect. Change one thing here, it'll change how the secondary folds, how the tertiary folds, and how the quaternary folds. This can determine whether or not the protein will still work in the future, because if you accidentally misplace an amino acid, or say you put the wrong one in, or say you put them in the wrong order, you can cause a misfolded protein that can have devastating consequences. Not only may it not work, okay, in your body to do the function it's supposed to do, but it also might form into a prion. A prion is a type of misfolded protein that's like a zombie. It goes to properly folded proteins and it turns them into the same misfolded shape. This is really, really bad because if prions start to form in your body, they can actually deactivate all of the properly working proteins to do a specific function and kill you. This is actually the root of mad cow disease which is a prion-based disease, wherein prions start to accumulate mass clumps within the brain that shut down the cow's neural system. Prions are also potentially responsible for certain cases of Alzheimer's in humans. Let's continue. So this is the primary structure. Now that you're con very concerned about getting a primary disease, uh, prion disease, this is the primary structure. Secondary structure is going to be where we start to have the chain folding into repeating arrangements. And this is because it's stabilizing hydrogen bonds between non-adjacent amino acids. Okay, so in other words, it's gonna be those other groups besides the R groups that are gonna be bonding between amino acids and are gonna uh, form into these repeating structures. Alpha helices and beta pleated sheets are gonna be the two most common structures that you're gonna see within a protein. Usually, a tertiary form will contain both alpha helices and beta pleated sheets, as we should see soon. Tertiary structure is going to be when this chain folds into the three-dimensional shape. It's formed between interactions between variable or R groups. Okay, the three different kinds of, well, actually, I add something here. Different kinds of bonds that can happen between R groups are ionic bonds, again, between positively and negatively charged groups. Uh, hydrogen bonds between those weak charges and polar groups, covalent bonds. But you can also have something called a disulfide bridge. This is between two amino acids that have sulfur in their R groups, and this allows for them to have a special kind of bond that we call a disulfide bridge. Do you really need to know the great details of disulfide bridges? No, just know that it's an additional way in which that three-dimensional structure can be formed. So the affinity or repulsion uh, between these different side groups, so in other words, whether they're attracted to each other or repulsed from each other, is going to help to determine the final fold of this protein. There are two major types of proteins that can fold out of the secondary forms into tertiary forms. One is fibrous. This usually has a structural role and is insoluble in water. This is part of the component that will make up the cytoskeleton of your cell that helps to determine the shape uh, of your cell as well as to reinforce it from damage. Globular proteins are often going to have a functional role in that they are usually traveling around the cell and performing various tasks of maintenance. So you can think about it this way. Fibrous proteins are like the, the, the standing beam within a, a house. They don't move, they just keep it up uh, and they keep it stable. Globular proteins are going to be the people that move all over the house, fixing it up, repairing it, or building it. Okay, so globular proteins are going to be the ones that go out there and do the work. Fibrous proteins are going to hold up the house. Quaternary structure. So once you have a couple of tertiary structures, sometimes they can fold together and um, basically like attach together uh, into a larger quaternary structure. Quaternary structures, again, or are not always going to be the final product, okay? So again, not all are gonna form into it. Um, but it can be really, really useful, especially for certain um, protein configurations that require proteins to carry um, in, uh, nonpolar or uh, hydrophobic substances inside. So they basically form a container around a hydrophobic substance or something like that is a really good uh, thing for quaternary structures. So here we can see the different levels uh, in three dimensions uh, and more of a sort of visibly rotating manner. These actually represent different kinds of models. Okay, so here we can see the order of amino acid sequence and this looks like a total mess. And you're like, what the heck? Well, yeah, when you consider all those different groups that are coming off, it's not gonna look like just a straight chain. In actuality, it's gonna look like a massive spaghetti. But if you were to stretch it out and look at it, you would see each one of these is an amino acid with a specific R group coming off of it. Here's the secondary structure, which is that you can see all the alpha helices and beta pleated sheets. Wow, that's a lot of alpha helices in there, and I don't see a lot of beta pleated sheets, but I'm sure they're in there. This three-dimensional structure is actually taking more of a globular structural role. They're no longer showing you the intricate details of the helices or the pleated sheets. They're just showing the basic three-dimensional structure of the protein based off of its folding. And the same is true of this quaternary one. It's just multiple of these put together. 
So let's talk about protein functions. Proteins do basically everything within your body. This is a weird graphic. I don't know why that's there. But anyway, so protein functions. Oh, I get it. Oh, wow. Hmm. That's a that's a wonderful. I'm not going to say, wow, you know what? Thanks, BioNinja. I'm not going to say this, but you can read it and I guess help you to remember stuff if it helps you. So proteins are involved in structure. So those are going to be those fibrous proteins and hormones. So they're going to be involved in cell signaling and communication, making sure that your cells know when or when not to transcribe or cut on and off certain genes. Immunity is going to have to do with uh, fighting off different uh, infections, pathogenic infections, whether viral or antibiotic. Um, Back by, or bacterial, excuse me. Transport, so they're going to be involved. Uh, you guys remember all the transport proteins that are within our cell membranes that uh, transport stuff from one place to the next. Sensations, so they're going to be involved in your nerves and all the various different senses that are involved in, you know, smelling stuff and tasting stuff. Movement, of course, most of your muscles are made out of actin and myosin, which act together in order to contract or expand, which allows for your movement uh, in conjunction with your muscular, with your skeletal system. And then, of course, enzymes, which are going to do most of the metabolic work in your body, such as breaking down sugars in order to help the formation of ATP. What's denaturation? Denaturation to uh, proteins is like the big bad guy. This is the thing that they all fear. Denaturation is when the protein structure is going to be dissolved. Uh, in other words, the correct folded shape of the protein is going to become unfolded, and therefore it loses whatever function that it originally had, its biological activity. Now, this can happen when uh, the protein is denatured, so when it uh, experiences a great deal of heat, um, when it experiences a high pH, when it experiences all these things, it can actually unfold the protein because it will help to break down the bonds that exist between those variable or R groups. Now, denatured proteins can be rescued. They can be saved. There are things called heat shock proteins that can come down uh, and bind onto the denatured protein and either envelop it or lead it to an area where it's able to sort of balance itself out and refold. Sometimes, though, denatured proteins are completely destroyed and they have to be broken down uh, completely into their component parts before they can be rebuilt as new proteins that can actually uh, perform their function. So here we go. Temperature and pH are going to be the two big ones they're going to call uh, here. Amino acids are zwitterions with negative and positively charged reagents. This is a crazy term that you do not need to know. All you need to know is that many amino acids are going to be polar. And so here we see uh, both groups are pronated. Uh, we have this one with a, a, a neutral charge, and this one's are depronated with a negative charge. Basically, all this is telling you is that when they go into an acidic environment, they're going to maybe pick up hydrogens. If they go into a neutral, uh, a um, uh, a, oh my god, alkaline environment, they might lose hydrogens. Uh, this is going to affect their charges and therefore it's going to affect uh, their binding affinities. In other words, how well they bind to their neighbors. Okay, so how do you actually get a polypeptide? Well, as we know through transcription and translation, we take a gene that's within DNA. We're going to go ahead and make an mRNA copy of that, and that mRNA copy goes out to the cytoplasm where it interacts with our RNA, otherwise known as the ribosome. And the ribosome is going to go ahead and facilitate these peptide bonds between amino acids. tRNAs will bring the amino acids to the actual binding site and will lock onto the mRNA to ensure that the correct order of amino acids is observed as the ribosome goes ahead and puts them together. Alternative splicing of one mRNA can produce various different proteins and variants on proteins. In fact, if we're really talking about this, an allele, which as we know is a different form of a gene, really just makes a slightly different variant of the protein that still works, or maybe doesn't, but it, the change, the actual physical difference in the protein is because it changes that protein's primary structure, which is what I'm going to go back to. Uh, and when I said before, the primary structure of the protein is going to change everything that comes after it. Okay, and then every organism has a proteome. So just like every organism has a genome, the complete uh, collection of the DNA of that organism, every organism also has a proteome. So that's the complete number of proteins or types of proteins that that organism can make. As you can imagine, a proteome is huge, and we can actually work backwards in proteomes to distinguish genes and genomes that create those proteins. Um, but the proteome might be significantly larger than the available number of genes. Because of that alternative splicing, we can take one mRNA and potentially build several different forms of a protein. So the number of genes that your genome can, or your number of proteins your genome can make is vastly larger than your to total gene library, which is pretty cool to think about. Anyway, the human proteome roughly consists of about 100,000 proteins, which is incredible.
Okay, so that's basically everything. Um, now, I do want to do, I do want to go ahead and dive into the next little topic here uh, while we're looking at it. So that was proteins, but now I want to go ahead and dive quickly into enzymes. And I promise you, I'm going to do this as quickly uh, as possible in order to take the best um, advantage of your time. We're about 20 minutes in right now, so hopefully I can finish this up pretty quickly. I don't want this to take too much time. So enzymes. Enzymes are a type of protein, specifically the, the globular proteins, the one that actually go out there and do jobs. They're called a biological catalyst. A catalyst is something that raises the rate or the amount, or excuse me, reduces the amount of time that a reaction takes to occur. Okay, so you have a thousand chemical, probably millions of chemical reactions occurring in your body. Enzymes are going to be helping those reactions along. The molecules that enzymes actually interact with, so the things that they break down or build up, are going to be called substrates. So no matter what it was, whether it was a lipid, a carbohydrate, whatever, it's called a substrate the moment it interacts with the enzyme. The enzyme can either put that substrate together with other substrates to make a larger molecule, such as we see when we see um, those um, condensation reactions form large macromolecules out of small monomers, or they can take a large macromolecule and break them down into their monomers, for example, uh, in a different kind of reaction uh, that we'll talk about in a bit. So the substrate comes down and binds them to the enzyme using something called uh, the enzyme's active site. The active site is going to be roughly shaped um, sometimes according to the substrate, although as we're going to find out here in a little bit, most enzymes actually have an active site that isn't specifically shaped to their substrate, but then as the substrate binds onto it, conforms to the shape of the substrate in order to have a tighter fit. Regardless, the substrate binds onto the enzyme's active site, forming an enzyme substrate complex. The enzyme does its work as a catalyst, and then the products are created, either built up by small components or, as we can see in this case, broken down from a larger component. Catalysis is the process by which we take uh, a large thing and break it down using an enzyme into a bunch of smaller things. So enzymes catalyze chemical reactions by lowering the activation necessary. So activation energy is the amount of, act uh, of energy necessary for a reaction to occur. If that activation energy is too high, we're not going to end up getting a reaction occurring and we're not going to be able to actually get products out of our reactants. If that activation energy is low, we're going to be able to get a lot more products out of our reactants or substrates. So the idea with an enzyme is that it brings together the two things or, or the one either the two things it wants to put together or the one thing it wants to break apart it brings it into a close controlled environment where the activation energy doesn't have to be so high it's not random chance the enzyme goes ahead and facilitates the reaction so it takes less energy and is more likely to occur there are two main models used to describe enzyme substrate interactions, as I said before. The lock and key model is the old model, and it's pretty outdated. It says that the uh, active site of the enzyme is perfectly shaped to receive a specific substrate. Now, it is true that each enzyme is specifically designed to handle a specific substrate. Okay, so a lot of enzymes are not generalist. They don't go around binding to everything. So that was the idea behind the lock and key model, was that the enzyme had a specific shape of active site that could only bind to a specific substrate, and that's why enzymes were substrate specific. But the induced fifth model turns out to be correct. The active site is not rigid, it can actually change. So that three-dimensional shape of the enzyme can warp and twist like a transformer. And when it changes, it can change its shape to accommodate that substrate so that we can go ahead and have whatever chemical reaction we need to have. Again, the active site shows specificity for a specific substrate and it's highly dependent on the tertiary structure. Okay, The tertiary structure of the enzyme, as we said before, is created by the bonds between its variable or R groups. If that structure isn't exactly the right shape, it's not going to be able to bind to the substrate that it needs to bind to. And it's also not going to be able to transform to be able to better fit that substrate. So if a protein is denatured and the active site is completely destroyed in terms of its shape, it's not going to be able to bind to the substrate, and this can actually lower or totally destroy your enzyme activity. So denaturation is going to definitely be something that ruins your enzyme activity. Um, so, um, for enzymes and substrates, I'm not sure, sorry, I'm not sure what this is. Um, hopefully this is not <laughs> something that's important. For enzymes and substrates to interact, they have to collide, okay? This is uh, true of every molecule in your body. Every molecule in your body is following a random path right now, okay? And as hard as that might be to believe because you are currently operating and functioning as uh, a very efficient mechanized machine, um, your molecules in your body are still moving around randomly. It's just that your body structures are composed such that the molecules, though they are moving around randomly, are sorted into non-random pathways. Let me put it to you this way. Let's say you have a bunch of people randomly wandering around in a room. As they're wandering around, you start putting put 
putting barriers up around the room. The barriers that you put up around the room direct their flow. Okay, let's say that as the people are randomly wandering around, you build a pathway such that the people that are randomly wandering around will eventually get caught in this pathway that takes them out of the room. Okay, that's the way that your body works. Your body is a series of pathways that are sort of constructed so that the molecules will travel in a specific manner and behave in a specific way. That's what allows you to be alive today. So the rate of your enzyme activity can be improved by increasing the frequency of that enzyme's random collisions. Sorry, I was doing my fingers there. <laughs> random collisions through those specific pathways with these substrate molecules. Okay, now there's several ways that we can actually increase enzyme activity in this regard. If we increase the thermal energy, we can actually increase the kinetic energy. So in other words, if we turn up the heat, we can actually make the molecules move faster, the substrates move faster, and make them more likely to bump into the enzyme. Now at a certain rate though, I mean this, this might be good up to a certain point, but at a certain point, different enzymes will denature based on whether or not they're meant to operate in that kind of heat. Okay, so we can include enzyme rate this way, or we can destroy it. All right, so um, we can also do various other things, right? So here it says denaturing, you know, and all that sort of stuff um, can react, and we've already talked about that. Um, now, uh, certain, and now enzymes are not consumed by reactions, okay? So they can be reused over and over. This is really important so that uh, we only need a certain number of enzymes that we actually need to perform reactions. The body doesn't need to keep producing more and more enzymes. That would be a highly cost, um, that would cost a whole lot of energy. Now, the other thing I want to say is that certain enzymes are specifically designed to operate in certain temperatures of pH. So, whereas one enzyme might denature in a pH of two, another enzyme might thrive, okay? So it really depends on whether the enzymes are in your stomach acid or if they're operating in your bloodstream, which have both have very different pHs. The other important thing to recognize uh, is that the amount of substrate can, be a, can affect it. Okay, now, before I get ahead of myself, and just to make sure I stay on track, I'm gonna follow the PowerPoint. So low temperatures might have insufficient thermal reaction for enough of those particles to interact with the enzyme. An optimal peak temperature will exist for every enzyme. If you go beyond that, you could uh, denature the enzyme and cause fewer reactions. Um, if you go less than that, you could also denature the enzyme, or you could just lower the movement of the molecule so much that they just don't interact with the enzyme at all. pH can do the same thing. So uh, if you have too little pH, it can denature the enzyme too more, much. You can denature the enzyme and also affect the substrates around it. There's usually a peak pH for each enzyme. And then substrate concentration, okay? So the amount of substrate matters. This really makes sense because if you think about enzymes as being like, I don't know, factory workers that take a, 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 a substance and they turn it into a product, the more substance you have, the more product you have. So the more substrate, typically the more reactions. Of course, this is dependent on the number of enzymes that you have because enzymes can usually only handle one substrate at a time. Uh, if you have too much substrate, all the enzymes will be um, active in trying to handle substrate and it'll be just like when there's a rush at the store and there's not enough workers to be able to handle all the cash registers the rate of people going through the store will greatly decrease so we can see that here as we add in a bunch more substrate the reaction rate increases up to a point where the enzymes reach their full capacity and unless you add more enzymes in you're not going to actually be able to get um, a more reaction rate okay so hopefully that makes sense all right, so here we can see many experiments can be conducted using enzymes extracted from food sources. So we can see uh, there's a lot of products that are produced by various different enzymes in relation to different things. We actually did this one where we took catalase uh, and we went ahead and had it interact with hydrogen peroxide to produce oxygen gas. Um, and we were able to, uh, and to measure the rate of enzyme activity by watching how fast a little piece of paper rose in the tube. Now, immobilize enzymes. Many corporations will actually take enzymes and they will fix them to a surface so that they can't move, and then they will spray that surface or coat that surface with, a, with other, whatever substance they want so the enzyme can break that substance down. Okay, um, so this is really, really cool. We can actually produce lactose free milk this way. If we pour lactose over. <coughs> Ah, excuse me. Sorry, I had to sneeze. If we pour lac, uh, if we pour milk over a um, a container or a surface that has a bunch of lactase enzymes attached to it, the lactase enzymes will actually convert the lactose sugar in the milk to glucose, making it so that um, the lactose is removed from the milk, so that people that are lactose intolerant can drink it. Um, there are many, many things. Uh, there are many, many um, immobilized enzymes that work in this way to help us to be able to produce. Um, foods that many people can eat. Uh, so as you can see here, lactose-free milk is a great way of um, reducing the production time for various of these things and producing lactose-free uh, foods. All right, guys, so that is our 
review of proteins and enzymes. I hope you enjoyed it, and thank goodness I stayed relatively within my time margins, although hopefully the next one will be even shorter. I hope you guys have an awesome day. I look forward to seeing you at the next review.